after the Second World War, the world, and the United States in particular, had an obsession with space. Space was the final frontier. After the evil empires of Hitler's Third Reich and Japan were defeated, it seemed like the sky was the only fence facing humanity in its progress and destiny. This time of unlimited dreaming of space was epitomized by things like the Jetsons. We were going to have hamburger bars in space. We were going to be flying off to all parts of the solar system. There were going to be hotels in space. We were going to have holidays on the moon and moon bake. German physicist Werner von Braun promised that we would have orbiting space stations. And this seemed to all be coming together during the Apollo moon landings between 1969 and 1972. The potential for space exploration seemed unlimited. It also brought great peril, with the Soviet satellite Sputnik being launched in 1957. Americans feared that the Soviets could launch nuclear weapons into their homeland. President Eisenhower was fully aware of the US Army's experiments on rockets that went into high altitude and into orbit, and that they were completely unsuccessful and came back a charred mess. But to the public, Sputnik seemed like a real threat. Eisenhower correctly assessed it as just being a tin can with a radio transmitter, but the US public saw this as the dawning of a new and frightening space age where the Soviets could easily launch their deadly nuclear weapons from the center of Russia to the center of America. This documentary tries to show that Eisenhower was correct in his assessment. Sputnik was no trouble at all and intercontinental ballistic missiles never came to be due to unsolved problems of re-entry. A senator from Massachusetts, John Kennedy, portrayed Eisenhower as being an old fuddy-duddy who was behind the times and asleep at the wheel, even though this was a completely unfair assessment. The only missile gap was in the minds of the American public with respect to what ICBM technology could really achieve. Supposedly, the Soviets had working intercontinental ballistic missiles with atomic warheads, by the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Well then, why did that crisis happen at all? Why should President Kennedy care where Khrushchev deployed his nuclear missiles, whether it was just off the coast in Cuba, or launched by supposed space-going intercontinental ballistic missiles from the center of the Soviet Union? It's because true space-going ICBMs aren't possible and this documentary explains why and why the Cuban Missile Crisis was a threat. It's because only short-range nuclear missiles are possible. That's why putting them with such close proximity in Cuba was considered a danger by President Kennedy. Things seemed to finally be coming together with the moon landing. We were there on the surface of another planet. You could see it on TV. Well, first it was projected onto a silver screen and then the TV cameras were allowed to film off the silver screen because obviously you wouldn't want the real footage. I mean, if you want to go back and look at the real footage of the initial moon landing, you can't because it's been taped over by NASA and no one was fired, no one was punished. Of course, they want to get rid of the evidence. Now, at this stage, a band of Apollo faithful will be howling in protest, we did go to the moon. Then why did nothing come of it? Why have we not been back in 40 years? The Apollo faithful will say, oh, it's budget priorities, we've been there, we've done that, it's not economical to mine on the moon. That just doesn't hold water, that's a load of rubbish. We haven't been back to the moon because we never went there in the first place. In the year 1994, I read a book by Ralph René which suggested just such a thing, that the entire moon landing had been a hoax. This is the reason why we don't have a moon base now, why we aren't mining on the moon. Werner von Braun promised a moon base by the 1980s. We don't have that. We have nothing in space, virtually nothing. There's the space shuttle which does low Earth orbit, and there's some rockets that go up in the International Space Station. Supposedly they repair the Hubble telescope through spacewalks. Aside from that though, we don't go anywhere in the solar system. There's no Jetsons future. There's no dawning of a space age for humanity where we can jet off to all points of the solar system whenever we want. Nothing happened. The moon landing stopped in 1972 and we haven't been back. We haven't been beyond the Van Allen belts.
which many have pointed out have deadly radiation that living creatures can't survive, not even a tortoise or a cockroach, let alone a human being. In Ralph Rene's NASA Mooned America, he pointed out that physicist James Van Allen was the first one to discover that space had deadly nuclear radiation flying around all over the place. Not only were the Van Allen radiation belts deadly, which are like two orbiting toruses of nuclear radiation around the Earth, but later we found there were galactic cosmic rays, which were deadly. And when the sun is having solar flares, there's deadly radiation as well. There's three different sources of deadly radiation and all of these very likely would have fried the astronauts if they went to the moon. So we're stuck here on Earth, at least as far as low Earth orbit goes. Well, at least that's what I had assumed until a few months ago. I'm looking at the picture of the Apollo entry vehicle and thinking, this truncated cone is not going to be stable in flight. This is going to roll over and over again. The top, the sides, the window are all going to be exposed to the huge heat in the direction of travel. They would tumble and roll out of control and mix up the astronauts inside, possibly injuring them or knocking them out with excessive g-forces. So while I had long suspected that the moon landing was fake, I had assumed that low Earth orbit was real and that the International Space Station was true. But my research of the last year has led me to the conclusion that not even low Earth orbit is possible, that the International Space Station is a hoax, and all manned space travel is fake. The main reason I believe all manned space travel is fake is because the re-entry vehicles are fake. I'll go through all of that in detail. First though, let's have a look at the International Space Station. I want to talk about some of the anomalies I see there. For the inside of the International Space Station, there are a couple of zero gravity tricks that they use to fake it. The first is they have a complete mock-up of the International Space Station built on the inside of an airplane. And that airplane does a bunch of rises and falls. It does a parabolic, upside-down parabolic trajectory. And that simulates zero gravity for uh, traditionally about 30 seconds at the most. I think they can do it to about 45 seconds, judging by the length of time of these segments. They have to do a hard break or they have to put the camera to the wall or away from a person or they can link scenes together they're quite clever in the CGI it's difficult to tell all of their tricks the other main way they simulate the zero gravity is with suspension in front of a blue screen and they use that trick for extended periods of time for longer than 45 second segments but they can't move around as much they can't do the acrobatic flips and rolls in the extended mode. So there's full motion mode where they can fully move around and that's faked in a plane and then there's suspended or extended mode where they're suspended by wires in front of a blue screen. They don't move around as much but they can make the scene last for a longer period of time. In this scene Chris Hadfield bends down in order to adjust something and you can see on the back of his shirt a couple of upticks on either side where you would expect wires to come in on either side of that harness in order to support it. Of course they've computer graphicked out the supporting wires, you can't actually see them, but what you can see is a very slight discoloration where it's slightly lighter and then it goes slightly darker. And that's strange, that shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows that this isn't live from space. They're often portraying that this is live. Of course, these things are fully choreographed and edited in advance to make sure that there's nothing too obvious that you can see that gives away that this is a suspension in front of a blue screen hoax. The other thing it shows is that this is not raw footage coming to us. This is edited stuff. This is supposed to be a legitimate space program this is supposed to be the international space station and we should be able to see whatever's going on but they edit things because the whole thing is edited in one extended mode scene chris hadfield on the right is going back he's going back 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 and then he just stops that's an odd motion you would expect if this was true zero gravity that 
you have to support yourself. You have to stop yourself on both the top and the bottom of your body as you're drifting back. If you just stop yourself with your feet, then your head will rotate backwards. Conversely, if you just hang on at the top with your hands, then your feet will still keep moving. You have to support yourself at the, both the top and the bottom of your body. But his hands, Chris Hadfield's hands, aren't touching anything. He just goes back and then he stops. And that's odd. You can see a sort of a harness sticking through the T-shirt of Chris Hadfield. It's a harness that's around the waist. That's how they're supported. Also notice that Chris Hadfield has the habit of bringing his knees up. That's because his stomach muscles aren't as strong. He doesn't have as much midriff strength as some of the others who are able to elongate their body and make the hoax look a bit more realistic. He's constantly bringing his knees up because he's not as strong as the others. Occasionally, though, the others bring their knees up too. Notice that in the extended scenes, which seems to be done in front of a blue screen, like if you have a look at this guy going back towards the screen, there's some strange shadows there, look like they're CGI'd in. Using computer graphics, they edit out the supporting wires and edit in these rotating floating objects. They always seem very concerned with the object. Chris Hadfield looks at it very closely. You don't want the object getting too far out of control because if it starts bouncing off the cabin in a weird way or goes back to the blue screen, it could ruin the whole illusion. They also don't bounce those oranges off the walls. I'd like to see them get a tennis ball and throw it around really hard and fast. And I'd like to see them do -si do each other really quickly, which they can't do, or they'd get all their wires tangled up. Here's another scene with Catherine Katie Coleman. Seems to be done in the suspended mode. Have a look at her hair. There's something odd about her hair. I know this is zero gravity and hair is supposed to stick out and go all over the place, but her hair doesn't really flop around naturally. It's always sticking out kind of rigidly. Maybe they permed it in that position, or perhaps they're hanging her upside down. As she shakes her head from side to side slightly, you can see the hair always springs back to a particular position with respect to her head. It should flop all over the place. The chain that she's wearing around her neck is a computer graphic. This is computer generated images. Japan, and that brings us to Koichi, who's in the Japanese lab Kibo. So Koichi, walk me through what you're working on in this lab. Yeah, this is an experiment called Spheres. Uh, and these uh, satellite robots are specifically designed to function in the microgravity. They contain the software that the scientists are testing. At first, this looks like a full motion scene to me, but on closer inspection, I think this is a suspended mode scene. When, the, when it's sped up, you can kind of see them swinging. And it has the same backdrop as the other suspended mode scenes. And then there's this weird part. Rick Mastracchio puts out his hand and he moves forward. Maybe he's using his feet to wedge himself forward somehow, but it doesn't look like it. The floor is smooth. His foot is behind that blue handle that's attached to the floor that he keeps both of his feet under and keeps shuffling back and forth on. He sticks his left hand out and then he just moves forward. He is Superman. That's how Superman moves forward. He sticks out his arm and he flies. The extended mode is much quieter than the full motion mode. In full motion mode, you can actually hear the sound of the jet engines, the engines of the airplane. In every single scene of full motion mode, in every segment of the International Space Station, you can hear this loud sound, the sound of the jet engines. You could argue that it's the air conditioning Sorry, system. Not even an office air conditioner is that loud. And why is there a loud sound in every segment of the International Space Station? That's because no matter how soundproof you make it, you can't filter out all of the sound of the jet engines. An airplane is just too noisy. You can put noise cancelling headphones on, on when you're on a plane and that doesn't stop the sound from getting through it, muffles it. They also use microphones that don't pick up very far away. If you have a look at this scene here, you can see that when the microphone's in the middle, pointing towards the guy in the middle, 
generations of space You can't hear now. the sound of jet engines as much, but when the microphone goes to the guy on the side, uh, you can hear the sound of jet uh, engines uh, a bit uh, more. So you can't truly soundproof the inside of the airplane where they fake full motion mode. You can see in this scene from the recent National Geographic documentary, Live from Space, Koichi Wakata is um, in looking at the, in the window there. Area this is full motion mode, us, and you can tell because of the sound of jet engines. In quiet I'm mode, in, they can I'm go to the copula and they can look space. through at their model. And you can see an amazing model. Gee, why would you build the International Space Station out of a bunch of long, thin segments that can easily break at the joints? Hmm. So there's their fairly realistic view of the rest of the International Space Station. The International Space Station was made piecemeal. They started off with one section and then they added another section, another section. It consists of a bunch of tubular sections which are joined together. It's an ad hoc design. Here are a few scenes from the tour of the International Space Station that they take you on. And I notice that there's no airlock between sections. This means if there's an air leak in one section, they will be affected in all sections. They're quite likely to all die. You could wear the spacesuit, that would work for a few hours until you had to eat, and then you'd have to take the spacesuit off and you'd be exposed to the vacuum of space and you'd be dead. The porous plate sublimator only lasts for a few hours anyway. Sometimes they're tethered. Do they have tether points on the inside of the International Space Station? Not likely. They don't really design it with life in mind. You could argue that they all scramble into the Soyuz and try and get back to Earth in the event of an air leak. Well, that would be very odd. They would have to completely change and recalibrate, recalculate all of the re-entry parameters if you're going to cram all 11 people or however many people they have on there. They have many people on the station at the same time. You also couldn't cram that many people, all 10 or 11 of them, into the one Soyuz at the same time. They only ever have one emergency Soyuz escape capsule. You couldn't cram them all in. It's very odd that they're up there in this life-threatening situation where an air leak could happen at any time and they could all die, and there's not even enough lifeboats for them to make it back to Earth. Having no airlock in between sections is very odd. The more sections they add to the International Space Station, the more dangerous it becomes. And yet they don't care. They just add as many as they like. yippity doo da yee-hoo! Let's all die in space! It will be just like that Sandra Bullock movie, Gravity, only the dying will be real. Lots of things could go wrong. They're on the edge of death every second, yet they act like giddy children with gay abandon. Another curious thing is the International Space Station uses several large gyroscopes for attitude control to maintain its proper orientation and so on. And there's a reaction control system consisting of rockets as backup, supposedly. We can only presume that the rocket-based reaction control system isn't employed very often as they don't talk about it. Given that there are so many people inside moving around, moving gear around all the time, and every time the solar panels were moved, every time the Soyuz docked with it, there would be motions impinging on the station, and this would move the station. So what you'd need is a system of rockets on the outside, burning fuel, in order to stop the International Space Station from misaligning, from moving out of place. When it comes to satellites and things in orbit, you don't want them moving around a lot. The International Space Station changes in altitude somewhat supposedly it goes up and down they supposedly bring up three tons of water every year that's hard to believe but let's take that at face value but they never talk about huge amounts of rocket fuel but even without the rockets all of these motions of the astronauts and the solar panels moving around would put tremendous strains on the joints and they're not flexible joints having a huge airproof flexible joint of that size would be an incredible engineering feat. They don't have them anyway. There's not supposed to be any relative motion between sections. 
The only time the International Space Station gets rockets to adjust it is when the automated transfer vehicles or the docking Soyuz space capsule comes and that's come from the Earth and that has its own rocket fuel and that can adjust the altitude of the International Space Station but that's only there from time to time. That's not there all the time. They would need a system of rockets there all the time built into the station but they don't have that. It's supposed to be one big rigid vehicle but that's the strange thing. They don't build the International Space Station with a tight centre of gravity with the pieces close together with a small moment of inertia and a small radius which is what you'd want if you're going to try to orient the spacecraft, if you're going to try and orient it with rockets or gyroscopes. You want a, a ball, you want a sphere. That's the type of shape that you need. Instead, they build the International Space Station out of long, thin segments, tubes that are joined together. That's a crazy way to build the International Space Station. That's the way a child would design the International Space Station. That's what I mean about it being an ad hoc as you go type of design. They didn't really nut it out, they didn't think about it. The solar panels are on the end of the station and that makes it even harder to control both the solar panels and the station as a whole. The solar panels would be better off being a more circular shape instead of big rectangles and they'd be better off being close to the centre of gravity. So that, as I say, you can reorient the vehicle, you can move it around. You should be building this thing like a sphere, but they don't. Another curious aspect is how they deal with water. There's no proper shower, so they must be incredibly uncomfortable and stinky the whole time, yet they have huge smiles plastered on their face. They can't have a proper shower. Nevertheless, they must use some water in order to clean themselves, in order to clean their hair. What do they do with this water? Supposedly they have suction for when they urinate, but aside from that, there are no special vacuum sinks. In other words, there's water floating around all over the International Space Station. Now, none of the surfaces are waterproof. It's just expected that you keep the water confined to one area of the International Space Station away from the delicate electronic equipment and so on. And what do you do with this water, especially dirty water? Because that's what water does, it absorbs dirt and particles. They would accumulate so much filthy water. The mantra, of course, is recycling. They're supposed to recycle everything. Wow, they have some amazing recycling technologies on the International Space Station that they can't demonstrate anywhere else. I mean... <laughs> It's a super water recycler that's compact enough to fit inside the International Space Station. Imagine how much maintenance such a system would require. You'd have to bring up so many filters and chemicals and things would be breaking down and you'd have to repair it but you don't have the tools to do it. So there's another curious, strange aspect of the International Space Station which endangers their lives and could kill them. But they don't care. They always have huge smiles on their face like they're having a really good time, even though they could die at any second. Another curious aspect is that humans emit dust with time. Their skin dies and drops off. That's what makes for most dust inside a person's house. There'd be so much dust building up on the International Space Station, and yet you never see them go around with a dust buster, with a small vacuum cleaner sucking things up. What do they do with the dust? Well, supposedly there's a trash disposal thing in the form of a re-entry vehicle which strangely burns up on re-entry even though the ones with humans inside supposedly survive re-entry. That's a very curious contradiction but they have a trash disposal capsule that they put their trash into but they never talk about the dust they never talk about the solid waste from the supposed space age sewage system that they have. That's another strange thing is supposedly they have a sewage system. I don't know how they cram it into the International Space Station. Perhaps it's in the walls of the station, but they never talk about the smell. It'd be impossible to avoid the smell of a sewage system in the walls of the International Space Station 
because they're trapped inside this tin can. It's completely sealed from the vacuum of space. You could have any number of super filters and try and get rid of the smell. It wouldn't work. They never talk about bringing bacteria up in order to replenish the bacteria that's, that's in the sewage system. They never talk about bringing all of the extra oxygen up that you'd need to let the bacteria process the sewage. In fact, what they must do is simply store their feces in the cupboard. They would have to put on a pair of plastic gloves and grab their feces and put it in the closet. There's no sewage system on there. They can pretend that there's a sewage system. There's no sewage system. So in other words, they're living with their own feces and the smell must be incredible. Yet they always have huge smiles plastered on their face, like the International Space Station is the best place in the world to be. But it would be awful. What about their laundry? Well, Chris Hadfield admits there's too much water taken for laundry. They don't do laundry. They just throw their clothes in the trash when they're done with them. It, it takes a lot of water, of course, a washing machine and a dryer. We don't have anything like that. So we just, uh, we just wear our clothes till they wear out. And then you throw them in the trash, and the trash is like a little unmanned resupply ship. And when it gets full of trash, then we close the hatch, and it undocks and backs away and, uh, and falls down into the atmosphere. So your dirty laundry actually gets incinerated in the atmosphere. <laughs> So take this woman, Sunita Williams, has supposedly been on the station for 200 days. She's never had a proper shower in that time. She's never laundered her clothes. She just wears her clothes for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a month, and then throws them out. In other words, she stinks. She's horrible. She's clammy. She's disgusting. Living on the Internet Space Station, you might be six months without a real shower. Essentially, you have a, a, a sponge bath is what you do every day. And yeah, you do get pretty sweaty because you're working out. But surprisingly enough, um, when the shuttle crew came to pick me up, it was one of my first questions, do I smell? And they said I didn't smell, and they said my hair didn't look greasy. So I was, uh, I was pretty happy with that. Every part of her body must be covered in bacteria and festering pustules. <laughs> it's the living dead on the International Space Station. Ooh, come here, my precious. And yet they all act like they're so happy to be on the International Space Station. It seems mandatory to smile if you're on the International Space Station. I guess when you're doing a hoax, you have to have a big smile plastered on your face because that's what distracts people. Now check this video out. The whole video is about a minute long. I said 45 seconds before was the maximum for full motion mode. It may be more like a minute that they can do this full motion zero gravity mode because then the airplane finishes its parabolic trajectory. It has to dip down for a short period of time, there's double the gravity. Anyway, have a look at the end of this, and there's a strange motion to the Santa. Take a look at the way it moves. It kind of skips out of control, out of her control a couple of times. First it dips down and then up a little bit, and then at the end it goes up a little bit, and she kind of looks a bit embarrassed, like she's been caught putting her hands in the cookie jar. Oops, I hope you didn't see that. No, we didn't see, Katie. Just keep the beautiful smile on your face and that'll distract us from the hoax. They supposedly urinate into these funnels. How do they keep it clean? How do they stop it from being encrusted with dried urine? You can't use water to clean it. You could, but you'd be wasting a precious resource and then there'd be dirty urine-filled water floating around the cabin instead of ordinary water. So to summarise, they're living with their own excrement, their feces and their urine. They build the International Space Station out of long thin segments. There's all kinds of motions being translated to the International Space Station through these blue handles everywhere. They could spring a leak between segments easily. There's no airlock between segments. They don't do laundry or have showers and they're incredibly uncomfortable the whole time. They don't have access to proper medical treatment or facilities. 
they have to routinely go outside to fix equipment because they like to put stuff on the outside of the International Space Station that can only be fixed from the outside. So in short, this International Space Station is a suicidal hellhole. It's an awful place to visit. Every second their life is in danger and they could easily die, yet nothing ever th goes wrong that they can't easily cope with and fix given the incredibly limited set of tools they must have up there. And they act like they don't care. The International Space Station is the worst place in the world to be, and yet they act like it's the best place you could be. When they're supposedly in the International Space Station, I suspect they're actually in the astronaut facility Star City Moscow. There's a specially built training facility there have been very few civilians in space. One of them is a South African millionaire. He had to do several months of training in Star City, Moscow. And what you do is you learn the zero gravity tricks. That's what the training is for. They will tell you, oh, it's training to handle contingencies on the International Space Station. And if someone gets sick, you know, you have to get in the Soyuz and quickly hurry back to Earth. Or if you have to do a spacewalk, <laughs> they have to hide in Star City, Moscow, because if they're photographed anywhere, it would ruin the whole hoax. They have to stay very hidden. In fact, they basically have to live in Star City, Moscow, as they would do on the International Space Station. So there are a whole bunch of frozen meals prepared for the astronauts to be consumed when they're on the International Space Station. In fact, that would be ideal to give to people who are hiding in the basement of Star City, Moscow, pretending to be on the International Space Station. If they didn't hide in Star City, Moscow, they could be filmed, and you could have, like, this scenario. Hey, Chris, what are you doing down here? I thought you were up in the International Space Station. Oh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just catching some hockey. I'm down here on a weekend pass, eh? Weekend pass? You got a glass elevator going up there? What is this, Charlie and the glass elevator? You wouldn't want to catch Chris Hadfield <laughs> when he's in Star City, Moscow. So they stay hidden there. One of them, as I mentioned, Sunita Williams, spent a whole year, supposedly, in the International Space Station. <laughs> She's such a tragic. That means she would have spent a whole year hiding in Star City, Moscow. One rather laughable claim I hear is that the International Space Station can't be a hoax because I can see it from my house. Well, can you see people inside it from your house? No, there is clearly something up there orbiting. It just happens to be empty and has never been manned. They are capable of sending unmanned things into orbit like regular satellites, telecommunications and so on. And they can add segments to this empty unmanned international space station. It's just an orbiting tin can. And the fact that it's empty means it won't really be subject to any forces moving it back and forth. And all the considerations I mentioned with people like Chris Hadfield going through the station at breakneck speed aren't a problem. So it's very possible to have an empty orbiting tin can, which is what the International Space Station is. And they have some cameras mounted up there as well to do some of the shots supposedly looking down from it. Another aspect of the illusion of space travel is space walks. These are faked inside a swimming pool. It's a custom-built swimming pool, and that's a great way to fake zero gravity. About six months ago, in 2013, a gallon of water leaked into one of their spacesuits in a matter of seconds. NASA doesn't really have a proper explanation for how on earth this could have happened. There shouldn't be water leaking into someone's helmet and a person almost drowning in space. How can you drown in space? They now wear snorkels to make sure that they don't drown in space. How can this be happening? A snorkel in space? There could be some water in the porous plate sublimator. When they were on the moon, they supposedly had a, about a gallon of water, but that cooling system is supposed to be well away from their head. There really is no sane explanation for why a gallon of water would leak into someone's spacesuit, unless you realise the whole thing is faked inside a swimming pool. In this scene, you can see the Chinese spacewalk, and you can see a bubble coming up 
from the guy's suit. How do you have a bubble in space? Space is supposed to be a vacuum, not a swimming pool, but it's obviously just a swimming pool filled with water. Obviously there would be some equipment that they could only fix from the outside, but a lot of these spacewalks, it seems like equipment they easily could have configured to be accessible from the inside of the International Space Station. It seems more like an excuse to get out and show their other space trick, which is the faking of spacewalks in a swimming pool. In this vid, you catch a glimpse of someone wearing a scuba tank. Scuba tanks in space? Snorkels and scuba tanks in space? They act like a spacewalk is just a walk in the park, like there's very little danger involved at all. They're looking through the spacesuits. Oh, <laughs> here's a spacesuit. We're going to go for a spacewalk. As if there's no danger at all, like they don't care. They don't care. They, they don't act like they're in a life threatening situation, like they could die at any second, even though they can. So you would think to preserve their life, they would want to minimize the amount of space walking that they did. But there seems to be an abundance of equipment on the outside of the International Space Station that constantly requires repairing, which makes for a good TV spectacle and is inspired by movies like Sandra Bullock's Gravity.